time is it? It's work on your Mopar time. We're doing the uh, blower install today. I have a little bit of time now and a little later and it's cold as hell in this garage, but I'm gonna get done what I can. Yeah, so here's what we did yesterday. All I did was get this thing bolted up, which I got the video of. I dry fit the carb and put on a little stainless uh, fuel hose to kind of try and picture the routing. So not decided on that yet. I gotta still pull this and do the inline filter and we gotta do gaskets between the carb and the heater plate and the uh, supercharger. And we're gonna run this heater plate because it makes a huge difference, huge difference in uh, operability on this thing at uh, cooler weather. You really can't rely on the exhaust manifolds or anything, you know, heating up this intake through the blower to the carb to a point where the carb's gonna run well. Um, a heated carb is a happy carb. Uh, you know, uh, this isn't a drag car, so we're gonna make it as streetable as possible. And this little plate right here, let me take this carb off. And here's that little uh, Edelbrock specific low carb bracket right there for the throttle and kick down cable. Let me move this out of the way. So this plate is just a pass-through plate for a four-barrel carburetor from a Ford. 65, I think. Uh, and it just manifold heats, uh, you know, the, the carburetor as as a heat riser would on a regular, you know, intake manifold, not this custom stuff. There's no provision for heat from this intake. And that's okay. Um, we're going to do... The gaskets get that going i need to get a uh, fitting to plug the uh vacuum port here <sighs> you know i might need to go find a the correct t-fitting for that you know manifold vacuum port because uh because yeah i think manifold vacuum is going to be where i want my uh yeah it, it is where i want my boost gauge uh so i guess that's gonna be something I gotta go to the hardware store for. Minor thing, minor inconvenience. Uh, you know, the blower's solidly mounted. I could take it off if I wanted to, pop the bracket here, four main bolts, and the whole thing's just gonna come off, but I have it RTV'd under there. Uh, I did that to get everything nice and flush, and because there's just a little, you know, minor issue with, uh, I think the case of the blower is warped just the slightest, like two or three thousandths, but you can feel a little bit of rock, and you don't wanna torque these blower cases down like nuts. You really don't. You don't want to go crazy with the torque down. Um, it's very low. You can warp this case and the rotors will start binding uh, if you over torque the housing or, you know, even just the uh, the housing uh, sections to itself. So you have to be very careful with your torque specs on your blower, uh, in which I was. You do your research on that because it's going to depend on what blower you've got, uh, what brand, whatever. So I'm not going to give you specs on that because that's not what we're here for. Uh, so yeah, we're going to just uh, pull this radiator, and it's uh, pretty straightforward. First thing I'm going to do is disconnect my uh, little thermal sensor here. This is just for the electric fan. Works great, 180. So I'm going to set this aside. And I'm well aware that this looks junky. Uh, I'll clean it up. The point of this is shade tree mechanics, you know, backyard job. That's what I'm doing. So, you know, don't get mad or nothing if things are not up to your pretty standards. Uh, for the moment, we're gonna leave the heater hoses alone because I've got some uh, new heater hoses coming and it's gonna look pretty nice, you'll see. So don't worry about that at the moment. Uh, really for this, I think all we really need to do is take off the fittings on the bottom. Are they 9 16 or 5 8 Let me see. Uh, 5 8 uh, Yeah, we're just gonna take off the uh, transmission cooler fittings and I already ordered Another transmission cooler. It's a frame mount from Derail. Uh, I think that's going to work real well. These 904s run cold, and another thing that I'm doing very soon, probably today, is ordering my, uh, uh, what do you call it? You get this wrench going here. Uh, I'm going to order my deep pan for the 904. There's plenty of clearance under this car especially because I have a raised up in the rear end. Uh, the deep aluminum panel holds several more quarts and uh, really the fluid is what keeps everything cool. And having an excess of fluid uh, in a transit, you plan on doing some, uh, you know, performance driving, some spirited driving on is always a good idea. Now these old uh, transmission lines are 
flexing on me a little bit. I'm okay with damaging them because I have a brand new set in box that I bought on eBay for 45 bucks, I think. Uh, and uh, that was a good deal. There we go. I'm not trying to do any damage, but sometimes things get damaged when you take them apart and put them back together, and that's just the way it is. And I can tell you down here that I've twisted one of these cooler lines on the trans. Not even bothered because uh, it's going to come apart just fine. Really what I'm trying to do is get down there gently and not mess up all the fins on the radiator. You know, that's, I know it's cosmetic, but it's still a concern. Uh, while you're in there, something to consider uh, while you're working on your radiator, dump all your fluid, filter it before you put it back in. But since the whole cooling system is drained, it's a good time to redo your thermostat gaskets, check your thermostat uh, in boiling water, which I'm going to do, pop this off, make sure the thermostat's working nominally, because uh, that can be a big problem if your thermostat isn't functioning correctly for getting a good tune on a car to see if the, you know, to see where you're at, you need a steady temperature. Especially if you're using like an air-fuel ratio mixture to tune it because that's going to... The operating characteristics of the engine really depend on a steady operating temperature. So I run a 180 thermostat in it currently, but I'm thinking about going to a 195. Uh, these, will, these blocks will take a little bit of heat just fine. Two, some people run 210s. I think the 195 will be adequate to really smooth out the idle. It makes a big difference, especially in what I would consider to be an overcooled engine. These are 600 horsepower radiators, uh, and they, I mean, to be cool, it's, sorry, cold case. You know, great, great radiators, but uh, this thing before with the carburetor was running icy cold. I mean, icy cold. I, I could hardly get it to 180 a lot of times, especially if it's cool out that day. And uh, for the sake of running it smoothly, bringing up the uh, block temp, We'll also bring up the water temp, which will bring up the carb temp and uh, keep the fuel vapor, you know, uh, reliable mixture so I can tune it appropriately with my, uh, you know, jets and needles because it's an Edelbrock and it only takes a couple minutes to tune. You gotta love that. This hose is old, so instead of fighting it off that nipple, I'm just gonna send it to a new home, a.k.a. the trash. I've got some that are coming. These wires are a little bit in the way. It's obviously my fault. This is kind of a mess. This was supposed to be a temporary setup to test the new headlight relays and the new, you know, fan relays and everything, so the wiring isn't finished here. And I never sealed up my wiring harness wrap. This is all the, uh, painless high-tech wiring wrap and uh, the thing about that is it looks great binds everything well and you can kind of put it in place and fidget with everything I knew that I was gonna make some changes one of the changes I'm gonna make like over here I've got my uh, you know my brake uh, you know power and ground or I need to rerun those and you move them back and run them just straight through the main harness uh, I've got my uh, choke uh, power for the carburetor I don't need it over here. I need it over back here. So I'm gonna split this, you know, disconnect these and 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 route my wires a little bit cleaner. As well as I gotta wire up the uh, MSD6 BTM. So that's all coming. But looks like we need a 716 to take this radiator out. So now cheap tools. Sometimes they get a little sticky. Sometimes they are a pain in the ass, but but they're cheap. It's to be expected. Some of my tools are nice, not many of them, because they have a tendency to go through them. After you break a few max and snap on, it's like, well, why am I spending the money when I could do Harbor Freight for half the price? Or a <laughs> tenth of the price and just uh, churn through them. I know it's bad theory, like some people say, yeah, you know, that's taking advantage, whatever. These things cost pennies to produce. They make plenty of money off me and my tools that they can replace them every now and then. That's built into their cost structure. 
So don't feel guilty going after the warranty on some of these things. I don't need to loosen this wiring harness per se. I think I just need to get the radiator about a half an inch out to clear this. Uh, I'll worry about that later to clear this because it's right up against the weld flange on the radiator. Let's get a 716 socket. And a slightly better wrench. We need an extension on this side. So, I mentioned it before, one of the things we're doing here is we're going to be putting in the new radiator with a screen, a guard. Uh, I'm doing, uh... oh nice, it's loose. Uh, I'm doing a protective stainless guard across the back of the new radiator to make sure that if I have a belt pop off, it's not going to chew through a $500 radiator. And uh, a lot of people don't do that, but it was common in uh, you know old racing days, especially with people running blowers, with big multi-V belt setups. They just run chicken wire on the back of the radiator, and that do a pretty good job of protecting it. So, you know, it's a little bit of an old school trick, but it works. And I got the stainless, so I can uh, at least say it's it's going to look better than just some Ace Hardware chicken wire. Let's give this a little bit of a lift here. Let me loosen it. This was a tight fit when I got it. The other one's supposedly the same size, and I'm really hoping that's true. I don't want to make a lot of changes to the setup I've got here. Because it worked, it will work. What was that 716? There we go. Two bad old Mopars. Always amused me. Is how much thought went into all the little fasteners and placements for everything. And it, uh, and it amused me how many times I'd go back and I'd be putting aftermarket stuff, not meant for the cars, and these factory fasteners and locations. And you know how many radiators I have wedged <laughs> into these old beasts? It's more than a few. That's a tough one down there. I think I gotta take off, I'm gonna take off my V-belt to get to that lower bolt so I can get around the radiator instead of rubbing my arm up against it. Let's take off the horn wire. Yeah. So, I'm gonna keep working on this. I'm gonna switch it over to uh, time-lapse mode because that's not, you don't need to hear me droning on about this. <laughs> well, I figure I'll bring y'all into the fold a little late because my last recording file apparently just pooped out on me. So, all I did was mount the balancer pulley. Now I had to mill the back nub a little bit, about a millimeter, uh, on the part that insets in the crankshaft. Uh, that's something, if you encounter it, maybe it's just my balancer. I'm not going to say it's a problem with the kit. Dimensions change for these things over the years. But as it is, um, you know, it's installed, so I'm not going to take it off. But... Uh, there's a like a snout that insets in the uh, hole for the uh, crankshaft, the balancer bolt uh, that is part of the factory uh, pulley. So the little snout, it wouldn't fit. I had to put it on the lathe and mill it down just a millimeter. So a total of two, about a millimeter um, deep. Uh, it, 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 it took me a little while to get it just right. I kept bringing it back over here. I wanted that ace fit. So, you know, if you encounter that, plan on if you've got an early motor maybe, forged crankshaft, you may have to mill the back of that little snout that goes into your crankshaft pilot hole there. Otherwise, she's fine. Now, I use a flathead in the little gaps in these brackets to get them on, right? This bracket is on. It's about level. For the belt that they sent me, this works just about right. So let me grab a little wrench here, just a 916 so I can tension this thing. Now my V-belt is back on. You'll notice I put my tensioning rod 
in place of the original alternator bracket. A lot more stable, and you can pretty much, uh, you know, adjust it by hand. It's fantastic. It looks good. It's solid. With that really nice Power Master alternator, I think it's the right way to go. So, that thing is uh, at Summit Racing. It was like 30 bucks. Totally worth it. So, down here, now that I got the V-Belt on, so you got to put that on first. Snake your uh, serpentine here. All right, and uh, the way I did it was I put the serpentine over here and brought this pretty close to level. There is a notch. Let me get it in closer here. Come on in. Right here. This little tang is part of the uh, tensioner. Now, this is a factory type tensioner. They just polished it, which is great. This little notch rides in this groove back and forth. So this is no tension. Maximum tension would be over here. I found that getting this thing pretty tight, you know, getting the belt close to tight uh, onto this pulley, this is what? This is about a half inch if you pull it uh, real taut. So that worked for me to be able to just say, okay, put a 916 on it, tension it, and bring it over this other pulley, which is all what I'll show you now. cold in this garage. Winter in the mountains, I guess. And all it takes, tension it, just get that taut, and you can see, you know, if you're in the correct grooves on all of these pretty easily, there's enough clearance, plenty of clearance. I already know there's clearance for the radiator. You know, there's plenty of room in here. Uh, just be careful when you're coming and going with the radiator, obviously, otherwise you're going to drag it up the nose of this thing and screw up your fins. This should be a pretty good tension, and you'll notice the notch right here, the little tang, is about halfway within the tensioner. So there's plenty of tension here. You push it, you can see it'll move a little further, but for a factory type application, this should be absolutely plenty. Uh, and when I first started, when I was putting the snout together in the earlier video, I mentioned that um, this is a press fit. So I had to... Uh, when I, when I tightened down the screws, I had to be careful not to strip any of them, but uh, it press fit the pulley onto the little spacer that we had put on the snout shaft, you know, in that first or second video. Anyway, um, so the belts are set up. All that's good. I put an inline fuel filter in here from Edelbrock. The factory fuel pump should flow enough to run this thing, but if we're doing high windouts, we're going to empty our bowls, and we're going to be fuel starved. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get an Edelbrock fuel pump, uh, a little electric that's designed to work with their carbs. Now this isn't a particularly high performance application, I'm running small jets and big needles. Uh, I, I'm going to tune the carburetor later, but for now, just to get her going, um, what's coming off the factory mechanical fuel pump should be adequate to start, and then we'll get the electric fuel pump installed later to make sure that we got enough for uh, you know any, any top end fuel starvation issues. So that's going to be one of those, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it type things. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, I mean, this is still dry fit, you know, uh, I put my gaskets in, check this out, I am picky with the way that I do my, uh, you know, gasketry. So this heater plate, I have a very, very thin Mr. Gasket brand four barrel gasket between this and the carburetor and that'll air seal it nicely, but underneath. I have that real thick, like 3 16 cardboard uh, spacer. I'm probably going to open up the middle of it. I need the perimeter to seal. But down here, there's nothing sealing in the middle. There's no braces or anything. So at some point, this is just going to get sucked down and broken if it gets fuel soaked. So that's why I'm just dry fitting everything. I, I got to make these modifications. And this one, we're just going to open this up into a perimeter gasket so that this center section doesn't wind up chunking through the motor. Minor things, there is so much to learn when you're doing this stuff. I can't cover everything. This is not a comprehensive review. Um, it's my installation, most of it. There are missing parts, you know, here and there, but I mean, the overall setup, if you have questions, just hit me in the comments, obviously. Uh, but I feel like we're getting close. I still have to install the ignition, get the radiator in, transmission cooler, uh, you know, and, and, and bracketry on the carb and such. I got to take off the hood 
I now see that this is going to protrude through the hood, so we're not going to run the hood as it is with just a punch for the uh, scoop. I think we're going to have to figure out something a little bit more creative there. And I'm not sure I want this sticking out for uh, keep bug catching just by cutting the hood the whole length. So let's get a little further into the project uh, and get everything mounted up in the scoop uh, with the custom base I'm putting on the scoop to keep it dropped down on the carb. Get all that done before we go trying to cut the hood. Because uh, as it is, it's already got a hole in it from the scoop that I had before. Let me show you this. There's already a hole in the hood uh, from the carb coming out over the hyper pack. And uh, I have the original piece. I'm going to weld that back in. So any cuts I make will be different cuts, not conjoining with that hole. Uh, there will be a nice polished Offenhauser scoop available for sale. Because there's no way I'm going to use it on this application. But as it is, I mean, the thing went together pretty easily after a few modifications, a little nick tuck on the intake manifold, you know, custom fab, little mounting brackets. Um, putting the blower together, the snout, those couple little issues I found, like rounding out the holes, you know, uh, going oblong. These are things that you have to expect if you're using kind of an amalgamation of parts. If they sell you their blower kit, it'll probably fit together better than mine did, because these are, this is a vintage B&M blower. I think this thing's 30-something years old. So, you know, food for thought on that. But anyway, I'm going to go mod this gasket and uh, I'm going to start putting the carb together. And so I'll video that. But uh, first, I'm just going to go cut this thing down and just take out the middle. All right, set the carburetor in place. I'm using the ARP studs uh, nuts, the studs that came with the AR. Jeez, I can't talk today. Nuts that came with the ARP studs are going on here. The black is a nice little color offset, but also, uh, you know, they are nice, strong fasteners I can rely on including the washers. In the back, there are special hex bolts that come with the Edelbrock low car bracket. Low car makes this to mate up to the back of these Edelbrocks. So I use these and they don't include any uh, lock fasteners, but that should be fine. And you can just set it in place and drop your bolts down through the factory stud holes and they'll hit down in the manifold and then you just uh, tighten them down with an Allen key. The appropriately sized Allen key, which I don't seem to have handy. Let's see about this. There we go. Beautiful. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab the camera and move it back over here. Pretty straightforward. You can see how the bracket rests back here, machined to fit these carbs. You just gotta find the hole. There's one. Just put it in by, uh, you know, gently. You don't want to scuff anything. And when you're working with aluminum, it's always nice to take your time and be gentle because you never know when something's going to shave off a couple little pieces of aluminum and get stuff stuck where it doesn't need to be stuck. Filings, trimmings. So this has given me a little bit of... a little bite. Um, just, you know, I want to be careful not to strip and, or go too tight into the body of the blower because, I mean, the bottom screw holes here are in the top of the supercharger. So you got to be careful not to do anything too tight or you'll uh, strip uh, a hole or even worse, you'll uh, warp the body of the blower. So right now I can tell I'm getting a little bit of too much tension there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take all this off and see what's going on with that hole and the length of this thing. I may need a shorter fastener if these holes aren't uh, drilled flush through uh, deep enough into the case. So, you know, let's, uh, let's pull it and see what happens. Okay. Okay, problem solved. So, the outer holes on this supercharger body, they look good for a few threads, but somebody messed up the threads on the outer holes. So we're gonna use the inner holes here and here, so all I did was open up the holes in the gasket, and it was a fiberboard gasket, so it took a little work. But now, we'll be able to tighten this thing down proper. So, let's do that. I've got my gasket, here plate, and gasket, and then carb. Things should just stay pretty well lined up, at least well enough for me to get in there. Now, here's the problem I'm gonna have with this heater plate, it does not have the requisite holes to go through. So it looks like 
for the moment, I can't run my heater plate. This is one of those things that's going to slow down or stop the project for a bit until you can figure out how to fix it. The problem I have is that this is a helicoiled hole and I'm not going to use that. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the studs in the few threads that they'll go, right? And then we're going to go to the hardware store and we're going to get a uh, threaded pipe. This is 5 16 24, real common thread on the top of these posts. So we're going to actually run, uh, I think I might even replace and put two more of these proper black studs here just for the higher tensile strength and, you know, I can guarantee that they're good to go. But yeah, we're going to, we're just going to get uh, some threaded uh, tube thread pipe uh, as a fastener and use that to secure this down to sandwich the uh, everything in place. The reason we're going to do that is because then I, I can use the heat spacer, which I do need, uh, and then uh, honestly, I might even get new studs that are a little taller because right here it's going to be a real close fit if I can even get the threads. So. I think I've got to go to the hardware store and get some nice long fasteners like this. Studs, 5 16 18 thread. Put them in and uh, and we'll go from there. What a pain, right? I really uh, uh you know, I'm used to it, but you got to you got to just you never be in a rush to put something back together when it's so custom like this. Uh, you're always going to have issues. So for me, I'm not mad this is tedious, but I can handle it. So let me get the fasteners, uh, unless I think of something genius in the meantime to get it done right. Okay, midpoint progress update. Um, all I did was put a little flathead screwdriver in between here and here to get these brackets on. It'll spread them out by a couple thousands and you can just slide them on. So you can see I got the lower pulley on with the factory, not factory, sorry, kit supplied Aussie speed bolts, lock, uh, blue Loctite on that. And uh, went in great, nice and clean install. Uh, belts are real nice and straight. Uh, everything aligned great. I got the tensioner on. Uh, I've got this uh, got this stainless fuel hose. We're going to be doing a couple of um, extra stainless hoses today. I'm going to be pulling some hoses, taking off this bracket, moving those little uh, relays down underneath the horn. We've got the new radiator to go in. Uh, and we've got, uh, well, I mean, the carb is mounted. I'll probably have to take her off because I want to get a, a kind of a clearance measurement on the uh, pulley here, which I guess I could do, but just by maybe measuring from here and measuring the hood anyway because i want to see uh, what kind of hood blister i'm going to have to end up using because this is not going to fit under hood not here and definitely not there so we're going to do probably a uh, cowl type and then maybe an opening for the scoop which you'll see so uh, i guess let's just get a few more things done i think i'll take a little time lapse video here so you can kind of see what i'm working on nothing super crazy and special but uh you know fun nonetheless all right let's get at it pay no attention to the mess I'm doing some moving around in the garage. So I got my cold case radiator here, Hemi V8 version, passenger side inlet and outlet, and a uh, little bleeder over here. What we got here is some stainless uh, expanded uh, steel. And the reason we're running this is because it's not gonna rattle against the this, but what it'll prevent is if I lose a belt, if I lose that blower belt, it's not gonna blow apart the core of my radiator. I've seen it happen, so this is my solution. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it's going to work. And you can't run a shroud on the inside, so this is it. So let's put it together, a couple fasteners, and then we're going to drop this radiator into the car. 
there it is stainless fender washer stainless metric uh, was it m6 uh and uh stainless lock washer and a neoprene fender washer so that'll keep it uh locked in and, and everything kind of cushioned in there so all the way around all four corners and this thing is it's rigid it's giving a little rattle what i may want to do is come back and do a, a neoprene lining down the sides later but not today okay so currently i'm doing some hosing uh right here i've got my uh radiator uh hose here it's five eighths stainless wrap it's it's kind of cosmetic but also it's going to be nice for the elements because for a while i'm not going to have a hood so if all my hoses are generally protected that'll be better for uh longevity of the car i've got my uh lower hose attached there you can see down there i got the radiator and look at that clearance no way a fan was coming in here right i've got <laughs> a finger now this was all mapped out i knew that this would fit uh, the last one did the one before it I almost had the room, but once I figured out the dimensions where this was going to come out, even though it's really flush, you know, cl uh, close to the uh, factory belts and pulleys, and as close as they could be, I mean, look down at that crank here. Look at how close that pulley sits. Even though, you know, it's tight, there's always a way to make it work. Almost always. And this is one of those times we made it work. So, doing the heater hoses for the heater plate underneath the carburetor. Got a vacuum hose here, the PCV valve, super critical for longevity of an engine. Engine uh, Before PCV, I mean, your crankcase would get bogged down, mucked up, just absolute sludge. Positive crankcase ventilation was, uh, it, people leave it off because they think it's a cosmetic improvement, but yeah, at the expense of half your engine's lifespan. So run a PCV. I've got my uh, stainless fuel line here. I've got a filter here. This is a removable. It's got the gold element in it. Uh, so that's a pretty easy little check and change, but I have a brand new fuel tank. So, and I know that my fuel pump's clean, my lines are clean, so that's not a huge worry. This radiator hose is going to the firewall through one side of the heater box, and then the other side of the heater box routes up back through the heat plate here. Bam, right there, and then comes out and runs down to the, uh, the input at the head. So it circulates through the cabin first. It lets this get warm, but I'd rather have the cabin heat. I mean, I live in the mountains, you know. So uh, we cleaned up the uh, the little mount I had for, uh, it was temporary anyway, that I had done for my uh, electricals for the headlights. These are relays, so, uh, you know, we're going to rewire some of this. I'm going to move the harness in a couple of ways because the old setup with the intake, I mean, a few things have to come out of the harness. So I'm just going to take apart my split loom here, pull this, rewire everything as I can, and I'm thinking of running the whole harness instead of running it up front here. I'm going to run back on the firewall and uh, down there with the wire package that runs to the alternator. That is a uh, one wire alternator that goes back. Mounts with the starter. Battery runs with the starter. A lot of guys run their one wire straight to the alter, uh, straight to the battery. Um, you certainly can. Some say you should. But as far as amperage drop, if you're using a heavy enough gauge cable... <laughs> which I am, you can see, the juice gets to the battery just fine. That last little half an amp or, you know, just a couple of negligible uh, amounts of resistance from uh, that extra connector, don't even worry about it. That means you only have one connection to your battery for positive, negative. Everything else meets up with the power elsewhere, and that's how I like it. keeps it cleaner. Uh, so, yeah, sorry, I'm kind of rambling, but just some things that we got to cover because you're going to say, hey, what am I looking at here? Well, there's your answers. Uh, and this is a vacuum hose, so this is here for the sake of without the hood, you know, it could pop off. I'm probably put a little clamp here. I might get a stainless for the vacuum line. This goes down to the uh, distributor. But, um, you know, the uh, little connection here, probably clamp that too. The other thing I found, and here's something you got to be wary of. When you have something nice, people will hate you for it. And people will mess with your car. So if you're going open hood... You got to keep an eye on your ride. People will literally mess with your car. It's happened to me before. It'll happen again. So if you're out and about, you know, uh, doing more than just a little cruise, if you're going to stop, get groceries, get food, whatever, always just kind of give everything a little look over. Your hose connections and your ignition connections. And if something feels off, if it's not running right, there's a chance somebody pulled one of your hoses, PCV, you know, vacuum, whatever, just because there's a bunch of jealous bastards in the world who, uh, you know, they, they can't appreciate something nice. They're angry that they don't have it. Um, 
And honestly, there's a lot of nice things I'd like to have that I don't. This is one of the nice things that I do have. So I plan on keeping it that way. Clamp your hoses, you know, and uh, just keep an eye on the state of everything as you come and go from the car when you're out in the world. Uh, learn that the hard way. Fourth time's a charm. I keep rambling in this video. Let's keep it short. Wiring harness unwrapped. I have to relocate several of the wires because of the way that things changed when I moved to this setup and with the new ignition. So, painless wiring harness. Their loom wrap is fantastic. It's really easily reusable. You can seal it up at the ends with the tape. I didn't before and I'm glad I did not because we have to make some changes in the way that the harness is laid out. These are my heater lines to the actual heater box and then back through the carb heating plate here. And uh, otherwise everything's pretty close to going together. Mechanically, we're, we're there. Just got to connect a couple little things and move the coil up away from the fuel pump. I think I might do it on the inside of the fire or fender well here. So we'll, uh, we'll get at it. I just wanted to give a little quick shout to say electrical, and that's the last of it. With that and the 6BTM, we just reconnect everything and hit the ignition and see what happens. So let's do that. Minor inspiration. You can see the wiring harness is apart. I've moved the coil up so it's away from the fuel pump and a little easier to get to. Uh, and honestly, it looks kind of cool. <laughs> but what's important is I decided to clear out this side of the bay. Battery tray's gone. I'll clean this up and repaint it. Uh, this will be nice for cleaning up the wiring harness. So now I got to jump the engine to the frame and then we're going to put the battery in the trunk plenty of space back there let me show you there's my trunk we're going to do a an aluminum battery box in that corner with a vent drop down through uh the little drainage holes that are in the bottom of the uh fender there and uh it'll still give clearance because this is the like package not package tray but kind of the equivalent it closes off back into the interior uh, there's the subwoofer so plenty of space and it's going to be awesome so, little hood scoop is on. You can see in there it's for the uh, it's for the tension or clearance. Uh, this is from the old hood scoop. So now I've sectioned that piece that I thankfully saved perfectly. So we're just gonna strip, you know, that's already stripped down, but we're gonna just weld it around the edge. And then the hood scoop's gonna get welded to the hood because, uh, you know, rigidity and it doesn't need to be perfect. A little bit of body shop, she'll be pretty as heck. So we keep grinding, uh, literally and figuratively. So we're at a midpoint. Uh, the blower went on, the ignition went on. I took minor videos on that. I finished up the wiring, as I said, and uh, the video I took, the videos I took of all of that uh, were lost to mishap, mistake, I don't know. I'm not always the smartest. I'm very handy and I'm occasionally clever, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure I deleted the videos with a phone reset update. Anyway, um, there's not enough walls for me to bang my head against to make up for it, but uh, here, have this little video and see where we're at now. And then the next one, we're going to cover all the little nitty gritty uh, in part four of where the car is actually at now. And, uh, and one of the problems we had along the way, by the way, if you need a transmission rebuild, I got a guy that put us back. It was a, quite a delay, um, but we're good now. And uh, I mean, you'll see. Honest to God, there is nothing like finding a little back road with your oldie and having some fun. So as you can see, we got further. Uh, we got where we wanted to be, and then we had a couple stumbling blocks. So we had to take the blower back apart and uh, fix a little noise that was coming from, uh, it seemed like the input shaft snout, but it was not. It was more serious than that, so here's the video on that. And then we started having some transmission slip, and it seems like my 60-year-old non-rebuilt torque flight finally gave up the ghost, but with a few small parts and a few hundred bucks in the hands of a very capable guy over in Gardnerville, Nevada, Douglas Radiator 
in uh, Minden Gardnerville, Nevada. Really good work. Um, good dudes. Shop full of classics. I should have taken a video. Perhaps next time I will. I think I owe the guy a ride in the car that he helped put back on the road. So, you know, video four is coming. And I'm really excited for it. Okay, all you rad cats. All you coffee addicts. We have a problem. I had a rattle. And I said, that's not a normal rattle. It's this constant rickety rackety son of a gun and it's more than just the input coupler now these are known for having a rattle because they're coarse spline and there's too much clearance between the input shaft and the coupler and the solution for some people is to get a coupler that's not worn out well as you can see i think let me move the camera up a little bit the coupler is nay worn out that's like new but <laughs> as i'm taking the coupler off i realize Hang on, let me steady this. The entire sprocket, the cog, it's rocking back and forth. The center bolt that I tightened down walked itself. So we are just going to take this off because it's causing such a racket. And because of that instability, a little bit of wear on the impellers uh, where they have contacted. And you can see that here. Um, it's minor. That means a little aluminum went through my engine, but that's so soft that they don't care. What matters is that we get this tightened and locked up so I can get this rattle out of here and stop these things from having too much uh, clearance, to, too much play. This, there's, uh, you know, I, I can feel it. If I hold this, I can, <laughs> I can feel the difference. So we're going to just tighten this up. We're going to take this coupler off, tighten it up. But this is a thing you got to watch for, and the factory did not include lock washers, but I'm going to red goo it which is the main stuff, and uh, I'm going <laughs> to so lock that sucker down with a, since we have the depth of play, because I can see my wear pattern here from the input shaft, uh, I can do a, a thin lock washer on this bolt here, and, uh, and we'll be fine. Sorry about the poor video, but I just wanted to get you guys up to date that if it's making noise, take it apart, and I did, and here we are. This could have been catastrophic over time or, or under a heavy load, so fix it while you can. Pump, pump. Rear, plunk, front, rear, front, and it's just coming out of that three-circ hole up front, you can see it. Third gear's messed up, isn't it? 